am Karen Stevens, and I am the accessibility lead for EA Sports. Now, the talk is called I Can't Hear You because I literally can't hear you. I am actually deaf. I lost my hearing in my 20s, which is why I still can speak so clearly. And I lip read. So during q and I'll have someone stand next to me and repeat the questions to me so I can lip read them easily. Um, so don't hesitate to ask questions. There's two microphones here. I'll direct you when we get to that point. Um, it's simply a procedural issue. So statistics. Disabilities are really common. There is actually over a billion people in the world with disabilities. These numbers are from the American Center of Disease Control, that one in five have at least one disability. By the time they're 18 plus and considered an adult, it's one in four. And by mid 70s is one in two. And after that point, the odds are in favor of you being disabled. So based on current life expectancy, the majority of people in this room will have at least one permanent life-limiting disability before they die. So right now, according to Wired Magazine, this amounts to over 30 million US gamers. Also, there are over 40 million people in the US that have some degree of hearing loss that was life-limiting. And not only that, but many people prefer to have subtitles on, especially if they're in a noisy environment or they have to be in an environment where they must be quiet like they're sleeping children. Um, it's very common for people to want things like that. And one other thing to keep in mind is that deafness is a spectrum. Um, I, I have some residual hearing. I, don't, I, I can hear something. I'm not gonna say it's, it's clear and it's very quiet, that's why I wear hearing aids, and hearing aids are not a fix-all. So what I hear is mechanical sounding and is kind of garbled, and there are certain tones that I just can't hear. So um, in fact, that's how I figured out I had hearing loss, is that I was writing a program that had a, a tone from low to high, and it was supposed to be one tone, and I heard two. And I spent hours trying to figure out, why on earth does my code have two tones? And I finally, in exasperation, asked somebody who was walking by, how many tones do you hear? One. Oh, OK, it's me. That, that's, that's good to know. And that was in grad school. So um, it's a progressive issue, but you know, I've, I've gotten by. And actually, it's given me a lot of insight as to um, how somebody would design a game that would be more deaf friendly. So audio channels are a really important aspect of this. An audio channel would be something like um, crowd volume in Madden, for example. You've got cheering crowds that make lots of noise. Well, I don't need that cheering crowd, so I would turn it off because that means other sounds that might be more relevant, I can hear. Anytime somebody gives me audio channels, I tend to turn off all background music so I can maybe be able to somewhat distinguish voices. If there are subtitles and things, I will definitely be turning them on. So speaking of subtitles, let's talk about subtitles and captions. There is more to designing games for people with hearing issues than this, but this is one of the more common ones, so let's cover that first. Font best practices. Font is the biggest issue right now when it comes to different types of um, difficulties in trying to read subtitles. They need to be big. Bigger is better. Um, also, the type of font you pick matters. Sans serif fonts is a really good idea because there's less embellishments, so those with issues like dyslexia have a better chance of being able to read it. That's also why italics is a bad idea. Um, it's better to use bold or enlarged text. If you have to use underlines, that's okay, but that's not as good as bold or enlarged because underline can actually cause some confusion for some people. But any of those is better than italics. Um, for example, for in terms of fonts with Ariel uh, Helviga and Verdana, Verdana is actually what this presentation is written in, um, because I try to follow these type of guidelines whenever I can. Um, so another thing to keep in mind is color. One in 12 men and one in 200 women are colorblind. Uh, it's on the X chromosome, that's why women are less likely to be colorblind, so there is a grain of truth to saying that women can see color better than men. Um, but just keep that in mind that you, using color as a distinguishing factor can cause issues. Now, it doesn't necessarily mean that your default font has to do all this, it's recommended, but let's say you decide to use something that's, that's relatively small, maybe kind of thin in all caps because it fits your world. Okay, I understand that, but at the same point in time, 
It's great when your game has options. So then you can use mixed caps, bold, something easier to see. And it's an option, so you still get your original feel, but people can have a chance to see it if they can't use that original option. Now, bigger than this is even better, but this is still a major difference between these two. Um, and I recommend this. Some people have an easier time reading all caps. Some people have an easier time reading mixed case. And it, it's best to support both if you can. So font best practices. Um, I recommend approximately 3% of the screen height. Um, for 1080p, that's technically 32 pixels tall, 4 pixels wide, and that matches the 16-bit era, more or less. That's about the size of 16-bit fonts were. Um, now, the absolute minimum I will ever recommend is 28 pixels tall, 3 pixels wide. That 3 pixels wide is super important because it means you probably have at least one pixel that is totally the color you want without any sort of dithering, and that's important. Um, I recommend bigger than that. So 3% is a good ballpark. Now, if you're thinking, that's huge. The TV industry recommends 8% which in the case of a 1080p screen is 86 pixels tall. So really, 32 isn't that much. Um, we're still well under the TV industry. If you can get up to the 86 plus pixels tall, that's even better. Um, that means you'll have a larger audience, people who can see. Um, and when it comes to things like mobile, consider using this font size for the system, the system font size, is you can actually find out what that is and you can match that. It matters less if the text is, is paginated and as smooth matter as you intend. It matters more if people can see it. If people can't see it, the text might as well not be there. And that's a situation we have in a lot of games right now, both in UI and in, in subtitles. So resizable text. I love this option. It's useful because the people who may not want the super large text can then make it smaller and have it take up less room but those who need it can make it bigger, and that's great. Um, I usually make it as big as I possibly can because it's easier on my eyes. Um, I don't have perfect vision, obviously, because I'm wearing glasses, uh, but so it's easier for me to have larger images versus smaller, and uh, I love when it gives me the option. Also, backgrounds. Backgrounds are super helpful. Um, no matter what, your text needs contrast. Uh, I recommend either a few pixel thick border, not counting those three to four pixels for the actual text. This is an addition. So you have an outline around the words. So if you have like white text on a white background, you can see something. Because I cannot tell you how many games where I know there's supposed to be a subtitle there, but most of it I can't see. So this prevents that. Um, also, what's really useful is when you have a block, a solid block behind the image, and I actually prefer that whenever possible. It's even better when that block is translucent and I can configure how dark or light it is. I usually personally prefer around 70%, but that's my own personal preference. Some people will like it super dark, some people will like it super light. It's wonderful when you have that option. So direct versus background speech. Um, what I mean by this and why I put these in words is that a lot of times when you have NPCs in the world and you walk by them, you can't hear what they're saying. Or when I say hear, I mean see, because they're not subtitled. And that's a problem. So when I'm playing a game, I may not know what's going on. Um, that is, you need some way to indicate that someone is talking. So here's an example from Lego Marvel Superheroes, where I'm literally playing as a Star Lord flying around the world, and I, I see that there's uh, some frozen guy in a cave. Literally, up until this point, I didn't know he was there, and I found him, and I would not have found him very easily, or maybe even looked for it, if I had actually seen, not seen that text. And that's how important it is. Now, here is this, literally the guy who I saved, and he's the one with the speech bubble above his head, and that's wonderful, because I know he's the one who's talking, because he's the one with the speech bubble. And that's important, because he doesn't have a name. Many times, NPCs don't have names. And that's okay as long as you know who's talking. Now, I would prefer that the words are not above his head because that can make it harder to read. But having a little speech bubble above his head so I know that the words are coming from him is wonderful. I love this. It's even better when the character's named, when you have a speech bubble and you see their name. 
So here's an example where um, Stanley is, is lost. Every, every single one uh, level in this game has Stanley somewhere in it. Um, so here I can see that he, where he is because I see his little speech bubble and I know he's the one talking. Layout. Um, avoid placing text on top of things that are important. Um, also avoid, avoid placing things that are important on top of the text. Both matter. Um, I want to be able to read everything on the screen. Um, if you hide either or, it's a problem. So keep in mind when you're placing your subtitles where everything else is on the screen and make sure that's communicated among your team because it's relatively common where one person is placing things on the screen and the other person is doing the subtitles and then later they get together and integrate their, their, their stuff and realize that they're on top of each other. So communication is really important because usually when this happens, it is an accident. Um, it's important to try to keep the text in the same location. It can be confusing when it keeps moving around. An exception to this is when you're doing things like cinema scenes and the area that you don't want to cover changes. In that case, yes, move it. Um, it's better to not cover up things that are important than to not move it. Like Not covering up things is like the most important thing. Um, keep things within a safe area. This is the same issue you have with UI and anything else. 5% margins are industry standard. I recommend to at least do that. Content matching. So each subtitle should be a single sentence whenever possible. Everything has exceptions, like literally everything. So if, um, if your text would become too fast timing or the sentence is super long, go ahead and split it up as needed. Mm. I recommend matching subtitles to scene onsets. Don't put the subtitles in early unless you absolutely have to. Um, there's always exceptions to everything, so these are guidelines. If the people's lips are still moving, keep the subtitle up. There's no reason to remove it, and it gets confusing if you do, because then people are thinking, am I missing a new phrase? Because people who, who cannot hear will not know. And avoid giving away reveals too early. So this is an example of when to break things up, so if it's a punchline of a joke, don't give the punchline before everyone else. Uh, can, can hear it. Let me put it this way. When I'm in movie theaters, I tend to be laughing when other people aren't because I've already seen what the punchline is and everyone's like, why are you randomly laughing? Because I know what's going to happen in the next scene. <laughs> so yes, try to avoid that. So speed, timing, line count. Again, these are all ballparks. Um, 160 to 180 words a minute is recommended. Um, it's a recommendation. So you can kind of use that to figure out what your, your line, number of lines should be. Two is ideal, but you can vary as needed. Um, four and more, I really don't recommend because at that point you literally have a wall of text. But one to three lines is okay. Um, two is ideal. To text your match of verbal words whenever possible, sometimes that won't be possible. Sometimes you'll have somebody who's speaking super, super fast with really long, complicated words, and you may have to paraphrase a little bit. Try to avoid that, but it is understandable, and in the television industry, they do do that. Um, so it's okay, it's just something to avoid. Now, you're probably wondering, okay, so I have all this stuff going on, and I have all this different text, and you know, I may have multiple people talking at once, maybe I have multiple places where sound is coming from. How am I supposed to do that all? I recommend channels. So similar to audio channels, you can have subtitle channels. So if you have like a different type, like maybe you've got a um, speaker over there, like literal speaker, um, that has audio coming out of it, maybe that's one channel. Maybe your crowd cheering is one channel. Maybe the main character talking is one channel. So you can turn on and off as you need it, which may also help change the words per minute. So it may be, let's say you're scrolling, you have scrolling text to the bottom. If you have too many inputs coming in, it might go too fast, but some people may want that because they want to, to hear everything that's going on. However, other people may have trouble keeping up and if you give them channels to be able to turn things off, it can really, really help. One game that does this already is We Happy Few. And here, at the very bottom of the screen, it's kind of faint, um, is the uh, audio that's coming from the speaker that's in the center of the camera. And the, one you, the text you see above that point is the audio that's coming from the person talking to himself. 
So here you can turn on and off either of those two sources and they actually have different spots on the screen where they give those sources and that's great. There's also different levels of audio you can have for the talking to themselves. That's great too because then if it's too fast and it's hard to follow, you can turn off some of the, the subtitling but not all of it and that's wonderful. So there is a difference between captions and subtitles. They're often used interchangeably, but they aren't exactly the same. Essentially, subtitles cover speech and captions cover sound, including speech. Portal uh, Still Alive is an example of a game that supports both. And it's really important um, to realize how important captions are. So like when you're watching a movie and you're saying you have subtitles, that means that you just have the words people are saying. If you actually have captioning, I know like what type of tone of voice people use or if there's like some other important sound going on in the background. And that's extremely valuable information. So sound effect captioning best practices. Um, there should always be an indication that this is specifically uh, a sound and not words. Brackets are ideal, and brackets are the standard used in the television and movie industry. Um, I, again, I avoid ver not relying on color. It's okay to use different color, but due to colorblind issues and whatnot, I recommend not relying on it. Also, if you do use color, I recommend making it configurable so people can pick what colors work for them. Um, there are many different types of colorblindness out there. It's a spectrum much like hearing loss and every other type of issue. Almost every issue people can have is a spectrum. So um, I recommend making it configurable. Describe sounds, not actions. You do not want to describe, I threw something at the wall and you hear a sound as it bounces off. That is way too many words and it's not very helpful to follow. If you simply say ball bounces and you know there's a bounce sound, um, that's great. Short, short subject verb format is super important. So here's an example of literally uh, energy ball launch, energy ball bounce. It tells me what type of ball launched and bounced and it's in brackets so I know for sure that it is a caption of a sound. And honestly, I probably could not play this game very well if I didn't know about this because I'd be walking through the world going, what am I supposed to do? And I see the text, energy ball bounces. And I'm like, there's an energy ball, where is it? If I did not know that, a lot of times they're not in easy sight. You have to rely on audio to know they're there. I probably would not have been able to play this game. But I could because captioning was loud. Music. You can use captioning for music too. Um, I can tell you that things like the TV series Monk has brackets that say upbeat tempo when you start watching that series and captions turned on. That's great. It lets you set the tone and mood and you have some idea what's going on. And that's the most important thing. If there are words, they should be subtitled. Um, it, it's important to try to give as much information to somebody uh, who needs it as possible. So an example is this, um, and we happy few, when you turn on captioning for things, you can see that this person is whistling a tune and it tells you the name of the tune. Now, I may not know what that tune is, but I can go online and look it up because it's a song that exists in the world and then I can find out exactly what that tune is if I really want to. Um, it's more information than just whistles. So it's really great when they tell me what the whistling is. Now, if they said whistling upbeat tempo, that actually would probably be a little bit better. Um, I would prefer it to know upbeat tempo and then maybe the name of the song, but even then, I could probably figure it out if I wanted to go online and really research the song, which honestly, believe it or not, sometimes I do. So going from there, cues. There is more to designing games for people with audio, uh, audio issues than just subtitles and captions. They are super important, but it's not the end all. Example, having visual imagery for audio events is super, super helpful. For We Happy Few, if you're in sneak mode, you can see everybody's footsteps. They make sound too, but honestly, I would have no idea how to tell where somebody was without this. Any game that has like, let's say you step on 
a creaky floor, if you see it makes a sound, if you make a little like poof of dust or something, it lets me know that something occurred. It gives me a visual indication. The more important the event, the sound event is, the more important it is to have a visual indication. If you're expecting somebody to be able to play your game where you're using sound cues, um, visual indication is super, super important. Um, when you're also, when you're doing this, keep in mind that playing with your game with the volume turned off may not be enough because you know what those cues are supposed to be. So I recommend, if you can, having people with different types of hearing issues play your game. Or if you can't do that, have people play test your game who've never seen it before, who have only played it with the game muted. It's not perfect, but it means that they're at least not biased in terms of they know what the sound already is. Directional indicators. Um, this is super, super helpful. Having some sort of indication on the screen that says, there's a sound in this direction, or you're being shot from that direction, or things like that. Um, it's really common in games, but it is super, super helpful for people who can't hear. Because a lot of times they have some sort of stereo audio that lets you know if it's left or right or whatever. I have no ability to do that. I only can hear really out of my left ear, and that ear is pretty bad. This ear is almost completely gone. I have no directional sound. So when a game is relying on directional sound, I am lost. And the way I get around that is if you have something like this on the screen that tells me what direction the sound is coming from. Now, in the same vein, um, you can have something like a radar that tells you where things are. So in this list, I made this full screen so you have some chance of seeing, because the radar is pretty small. But I can tell there's an enemy in front of me and there's an ally behind me. And it's, it helps me know where my team is, it helps me know where I am, it helps everybody. But without that, I would have no idea. I can't hear people behind me. So when I'm playing a game with other people, like I play, I play games with other people who know that I can't hear very well, but they're like, didn't you hear that guy sneaking up behind you? I'm like, uh, no. <laughs> so um, this helps even the playing ground so everyone can have an enjoyable experience. Another thing that's helpful is environmental sounds. So this is Marvel, uh, Lego Marvel superheroes. When an undead creature is creeping up on you and getting close, it sucks all the color out of the world, or the majority of the color out of the world, to give it a creepy vibe. That's awesome. It gives me a whole sense of immersion, even though I can't really tell that that audio is there. So that's really cool. I wish more games did this. And keep in mind, cues may not just be audio. They can be controller vibrations too. So for Diablo 3, for example, um, if I'm playing, especially single player, there is this creature called a nemesis that can spawn in that's like super powerful compared to standard creatures. And there is a vibration pattern to the controller that warns you it's coming. There's also supposedly, and I say supposedly because I've literally never heard it, a horn that um, happens at the same time. People are like, oh, can't you hear that horn? No, but I can feel the controller. Another important thing to realize is that I actually play all games completely muted, which may seem counterintuitive. However, I'm trying to listen to party chat. And if I have any sort of background noise, if I'm playing a multiplayer game with party chat, I am not going to know what's going on, what people are saying. So I have to mute the games if I want to be in an Xbox party and have a prayer of understanding people. So yeah, those are all super important things. Um, last thing, really important thing, settings. If you can't, I cannot find those settings, they might as well not be there. It's important to make all accessibility settings accessible. You should be able to find them uh, where you, in, in like an easy location. It's okay if they're in multiple menus. So let's take Madden, for example. Madden has an accessibility menu that has things like volume control channels in it or menu narration, things like that, or uh, long shot subtitles. I can tell you that a good chunk of the controls on the screen are on other screens. Like volume control has its own menu. But they're also here, so people who are looking for that sort of thing can find it easily, and they're in multiple locations. It's absolutely fine to have it in multiple locations. It's a problem that people can't find it. Um, they should also be available when you're entering the game. So in, if you see the little person standing there in the bottom corner, that's accessibility settings. And if you were to move your cursor over it, it actually shows what it is. 
It's also important that they're in pause menus so you can get to it easily and you don't have to back out of the entire game. So, thank you for your time. And I hope you got some use out of that. And if you have any questions, please ask. Um, I'm available on uh, email, Twitter. And also I encourage if you have bugs in EA games that are accessibility related, go to ea.com slash able. Um, there is a bug form there. It's also a shortcut of slash able slash bugs. Um, it's, it, if you put things in there, I actually have a team that I'm working with that are going through and helping disperse that information among teams. And we're trying to give accessibility a higher priority because we know that that means that people can't play the game. And we want to make games people can play. So, and that's also um, why I have the Twitter account and the email is we're trying to get all the information we can just so we can make games people can play. Because nobody is sitting around going, oh, I want to make games that no one can use, or like we just exclude a whole section. So, no, it's accidental. So awareness is key. And um, I, I really hope that you can bring that information back. Yeah, for resources in general, um, I recommend 4.5 to 1 contrast ratio or higher between text and backgrounds. You can find that information on contrast-ratio.com and actually test colors. And in general, gameaccessibilityguidelines.com is really helpful for just any type of issue. Now, I'd like to take questions, and I'll need um, somebody to come next to me to do that. Um, <clears throat> I'd be happy to actually answer questions on any issue, because my job is, as an accessibility lead actually covers all types of disabilities. I prefer focusing on audio. But um, if you want to meet me in the wrap-up room in 204 after, I'm happy to talk about any issue. Thanks. So if you can come up to the microphones on either side, if you have a question, that would be helpful. Hi. Um, my question is, uh, is there like a, a standard or preferable position for subtitle or caption text? Okay, I think I got that. Um, the question was, is there a standard for subtitles and text, right? Like the position, like whether it's the top of the screen or the bottom. Television industry, yes. Game industry, no. Um, you can find information. If you like, search for um, BBC has um, subtitles. Like they have like 200 and some odd pages uh, guide on how to do subtitles and captioning. Um, so if you want extremely extensive information, look for the BBC Subtitle and Captioning Guide online. You'll find hundreds of pages of information. Okay, cool. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Hi. Uh, thank you for the talk. Uh, I was wondering, have you ever seen a good example of a sound puzzle in a game that works for deaf people? Okay, I heard you. Uh, have you heard of a great example for subtitle what? A sound puzzle. A sound puzzle game. Um, no, I have actually not seen a sound puzzle game that's really good at giving information. I generally can't play those. Um, games like that are like music games though, like um, Rock Band for example and all that, I can play because it gives me enough feedback where I can sort of match what's going on. Uh, I'm not gonna say I'm the best singer in the world, thank God I can't hear myself, but um, you know, I can still play those games, but anything that requires me to actually hear what the exact note is and match it, I can't do. Yep. Hi. Um, do you know of any external resources to send builds to to rate for accessibility or provide guidelines? Okay. I think the question was, do I know of any place where you can uh, have external people test your thing based on the game accessibility guidelines? Um, I believe if you go to um, Able Gamers, actually, it's, I think it's, yeah, search online for Able Gamers. They have a um, group of people they've gotten together that does just that. Okay. So, yeah, search for Able Gamers Charity. They have um, the ability you can hire people through them. Thank you. Hi. Uh, one of the challenges my accessibility team has is drawing up fine line between not spoiling gameplay or narrative content while also providing tells for things that may be time dependent or a, a boss attack that is needing to be telegraphed in that way. Do you have any advice on you know, good decision making practices where we, we try to find that line? You have to repeat that. We're using audio tells for boss attacks. Do you have any suggestions on how to do that? 
audio tells or audio what tells? Telegraphing the boss is about to attack. Ah, the the bot. The, yeah, okay. So you're you're asking how to basically avoid punchlines, more or less, in terms of like, or in, it could be an action like a boss attack. Correct, right? without spoiling content. Without spoiling the content. Um, that that's when you do real work with timing. That's why I was explaining earlier that like if you're doing a joke, you don't want to give away the punchline. So if you could do the boss attack sound. Like you definitely want to say you hear this sound, like the boss attack sound. So if people can actually hear it, it's okay to make a visual representation of it. Excellent. Or maybe when the when you have the boss roaring, there's actually a visual like distortion on the screen or something because it's just such intense, or that makes the controller vibrate. That's an option too. It doesn't have to actually be words. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, my accessibility team has also done a lot of user research on We Happy Few, which we helped publish. So um, on behalf of them, thank you uh, for, the, for the kind words. Uh, that, that means a lot to them. Now, I didn't fully catch that, so I'll ask him a minute. But I love the fact you have an accessibility team. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what did you say? I got it. Okay, so we are out of time. Uh, this is fine. I will be next door in 204. You're welcome to ask me whatever you'd like about any type of issue. Thank you.